This dynamic Bible-based message was recorded at Good Hope Christian Center. Now, let's listen to this exciting, Holy Spirit-inspired message. One of the most wonderful things is to be young. Let me hear amen. amen. <laughs> and one of the things when you come into church, people have this idea that you need to be, you're young, but you need to be old. You need to act old, you need to be old, and that's why people get old quickly is because they don't think that, they don't have this young um, expression of themselves anymore. And I'm not talking about being mature or anything else, I'm just saying that they lose that joy of being young. And it doesn't matter how old you are, inside of your head, you still think you're 18. And that's a wonderful thing to be because your body does it. When you go to the gym, your body tells you, you're not 18. You are not, definitely not. Because what you could push at 18, you can't push now. And, uh, but it's a wonderful thing. And, and so what I discovered when I came into the world, I was just speaking to, to Luke about it as well, um, is that... When you come, and this is what I was going to speak about, but when I saw the way your, the service was going, um, I felt I needed to speak to your heart because so many times people come into the church and you, th you think you have to start acting weird now and not real anymore. And there's this uh, pressure sometimes that it's, it might be actual pressure or might just be in your mind that you have to become perfect that you have to become pure. Holiness in the Bible doesn't mean to be pure. Holiness means that you separate yourself from the world and unto God. That's what holiness means, is to separate yourself. To separate yourself, and that's what the Bible says, not what the story I made up. Holiness in the Hebrew means a separation from something to someone, or some, from something to something else. It's a separation. And it doesn't mean you have to get all weird and spooky spiritual. And so, so many times we can do that. And when the presence of the Holy Spirit comes as well, it doesn't mean it's all like spooky and weird. The Holy Spirit is here as your God. He's here as a comforter. He came to this earth to take the place. Jesus said, it's better that I go away and I'm sending another just like me. Just like I comforted the disciples, just as I operate on earth, the Holy Spirit is going to operate in exactly the same way, except it's going to be more personal. He's not going to just be upon you, he's going to be within you. And as a young person, that's the most important thing, is to know that the Holy Spirit is within you. If you I know that some of you went away to a camp and you got, some got filled with the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit that when the Holy Spirit comes within you, it's to enable you to be able to do the things the Word asks you to do. It's to give you strength. The Holy Spirit upon you is for ministering to others. And so I just wanted to, when I got saved, I thought all weird people come to church. You know, always wear suits and they ties and they act all grumpy and they didn't like anything. Um, they'd lost, they, the last music they listened to was um, Pet Boone. In the 1960s, it's the only time they were ever happy. Otherwise, it's, you know. And there's a real life out there that we can live as Christians and not be ashamed of anything. And we can live a real life that is attractive. A lot of times people don't come to church because Christianity has been presented in a way that it's not attractive anymore. The gospel is good news. I want you to understand something tonight. When you get saved, you don't get saved so you can go to heaven and stay out of hell. That is not the reason for getting saved. That is a benefit of being saved. The heart of salvation is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life is not something that's coming in the future. Eternal life is something you have now. If you turn with me to John 17 verse 3. John 17, verse 3. Now, Jesus was... When Jesus had spoken these things, he lifted up his eyes and he began to pray to the Father. So this is Jesus speaking about eternal life. This is not uh, anybody else talking about it. It's Jesus. So in, in verse in, 
uh, John 17, verse 3, and he's praying, and he's saying, and he's praying, he says, and this is eternal life. It means, now Jesus is giving you the meaning of eternal life. It means this, to know, to perceive, to recognize, become acquainted with, and understand you. He's saying eternal life is perceiving, understanding God. It's to get to know him, to know him personally. You, the only true and real God. And likewise, in the same way, to know him, Jesus, as the Christ, the anointed one, whom you have sent. So in other words, eternal life is not just getting into heaven. You can't use Jesus to, for salvation to get into heaven and stay out of hell. That is not the... That is not the heart of salvation. Those are benefits of salvation. The heart of salvation is getting to know God and getting to know Jesus Christ through the Word of God by the, with the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth. And it's up to each one of us. It's, it's not, it has nothing to do with anyone else. Understand something. Nobody is coming to save you. It's you and Jesus alone. Don't try and rely on anybody else. Other people have got their own problems. I realized that a long time ago when I first got saved, other people are so busy with their own things and they have every right to be busy with their own things. We are so used to other people helping us that we're not helping ourselves. D Bible discipline is when I see something in the Word of God, I correct myself. I don't have to have somebody else correct me. I correct myself because that's what Bible discipline is. I see something in the Word that I'm not doing. The Bible says that when you pray, if I'm not praying, then I pray. The Bible says if you pray, I will heal your land. The Bible is, a, I call it a very iffy book. In other words, there are a lot of ifs. In Zulu, it's umau, if you. If you will pray, I will heal your land. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So these are conditions to every single promise that God is, even if to, for salvation, there's a condition for salvation. If you have to believe that he is the son of God and then accept him as the son of God, you have to believe to receive. It doesn't just come freely. There's a, there's a, 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 a commitment, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, in, in a, there's a, a contract or there's a, your side that is played. And so we have to understand something. I, understand, I, I was always looking for people to try and help me in my spiritual walk and it's fine for them to do that, but when you're so totally reliant on somebody else that you can't do anything for yourself, what happens when you get sick? Who's going to be there for you? When I got sick and I was dying in hospital, people, my condition was so bad that my pastor was crying. And if, you see your, if you're in hospital and you see your pastor cry, you know you're in big trouble. And so I, had a real, I realized something in my life that everything that you do, give God the glory. Because when somebody helps you out, they will always bring it up. I helped you. I lifted you. But when you and God, it's you and God alone, and he gets all the glory. Lord, when you heal me, I promise to give you the glory. I promise to give you the praise. When you bring me through, when we come through, and begin to include him, because he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I, in our church at home, we never ever say, Holy Spirit, uh, say, Holy Spirit, will you manifest yourself or be here? Because the, Holy, the Bible says that he's already there. He never leaves us or forsakes us. So wherever you are, you have the Holy Spirit within you and upon you. He's there all the time. There's an unction on the inside of you. When the Holy Spirit comes, he doesn't go and come. You might feel like that. Sometimes when you go to a meeting, you might feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, but he's, it's just that your, your body has, is adapting to it or you feel it. But the, the Holy Spirit is there whether you feel him or not. And we need to understand that we, in this world today, we are so dependent on feelings. I want to feel something. I, I, I want to know something. I, if I don't feel it, then it can't be real. And that's a lie of the devil because God has said, I'm with you. I'll be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And so by faith, I, I take that. I accept that God said that. I know that he cannot lie and he cannot fail. And if he said that, then he's there, whether I feel it or not. That's what faith is. Faith is not... If you, if, if faith is not working if you're feeling something. Faith is no feeling. There's no feeling to faith. Faith accepts God's raw word and says, you said it, I believe it, that settles it. I don't care what I feel. 
I'm going to go because you said that lay hands upon the sick. I lay hands upon the sick because God said lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Every time I lay hands upon the sick, I expect them to be healed. Whether they fall down or whether they don't, I have an expectation. The Bible says or whether they don't, I have an It doesn't say pray for the sick. It said heal the sick. What we have done is we've stepped back from our God-given authority as God-given representatives, and especially as young people, you need to know that you need to step up. Don't worry what anybody else is doing. Don't care what this person's doing or this person's doing or how that person's doing. You yourself, God wants fellowship with you. He wants to talk to you. He wants you to see your value and your worth, and the only place you see it is in the cross. Because God loved you so much that he gave his son to be punished in your place. God punished Jesus for you. Why did you go so quiet in church? Do you know that the Bible says that? Let me read it to you. So you don't get confused. Go to Isaiah 54. So Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He was, has put him to grief and made him sick. When you and he make his life an offering for sin. And he has risen from the dead in time to pass, and he shall see the, his spiritual offspring. He shall prolong his days. And the will and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The Bible says it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. So who punished Jesus for your sin? Have you ever thought about who punished Jesus? Do you know that Jesus went to hell? What did he do in hell? Why did he go to hell? You see, he had to take a body like we have because he couldn't, he couldn't take a sin upon himself as God. And so he had, he had a body that was prepared for him. He grew up in our, in our world, so he knows exactly what it's like to be you. He never sinned. He was tempted in all ways, but never sinned. And so he was perfect. And only someone that is perfect could take his sin, your sin and my sin upon yourself, his, your sickness and my sickness upon himself, and he took the sin upon himself, he said he took it off you, and he placed it on himself. He took your sickness and placed it on himself. Your, your disease, your, your sin, the, every single sin that you've done or ever going to do was placed upon him. The sin from the beginning of time until the end of time was placed upon him. And then God punished him. Now full punishment doesn't come unless you go to hell. Because that's what we preach, isn't it? If you don't accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're going to die and you're going to be separated from God for eternity. Where will you be? In hell. That's what we preach. So if Jesus wasn't punished fully, he didn't go through it fully, then the, 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 the price hasn't been paid fully. But Jesus went down into hell for three days and three nights. He was in hell. Then the courts of justice said enough is enough. And God raised him up by the power of the Holy Spirit. The same power of the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of you. Ephesians 1.17 talks about that we will get to know, have knowledge of the same power that God exercised in raising Jesus from among the dead. And so that power he has placed within us. But your sins have been totally paid for. They weren't just covered. They were washed away. Washed away. So that you can come into the very presence of God through Jesus' torn apart body, broken body. You can come through his body as, a, as if it were a veil, as if it were a curtain. His body was torn apart so that you can come through that into the very presence of God himself. Each one of us can. You don't have to go through a pastor, which will be a disaster if you do. So when I realize that he chose me and he chose you before time, before he thought of anything else, he chose you. You have, if you don't see your worth, a lot of people uh, don't, see, don't see your worth. People will put you into little boxes, especially in a church. No, you this, you that. You can do tables, you can do this, you can do that. And we assign 
uh, um, uh, almost like over your head, your Mr. So-and-so does this, and Mrs. So-and-so does that. But the Bible says we consider one another no longer according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In other words, when you are born again, I look at you as a born again fresh, brand new creation in Christ Jesus. I don't look at you as far as your job is concerned or your name is concerned or your position is concerned. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that we, con we considered Christ after the flesh, but no longer. We don't consider anybody according to the flesh any longer. Bible, your job, your title, your rank, we don't consider that anymore. Each one is a new creation in Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus, when you were born again, you are fresh formation. You have no history. You have no past. Just as a newborn baby is born, you are born again into this world. And the, the, one of the tricks of the devil is to keep bringing up your past and to br bring shame to your past or guilt for your past. And people would say to me, Llewellyn, you remember when you did this? I said, no, I don't. That Llewellyn died. You have, there has to be inside of your mind a single thought where you break away from your past. Only you can do that. No pastor can help you with it. Nobody. Else. You have to renew your mind to start thinking like a new creation. And that new creation has been given the, the absolute um, authority to come into the presence of God. Because Jesus cleansed you. Jesus washed your sin away. Because he was already punished for what you did. That is the love of God. We can, it's this, this love of God is not an emotional thing. It's not all about emotion. I tried to build up this emotion. I thought, you know, if for emotion, you need to cry. I, I went, went to my room. Oh, I love you, Lord. I love you. <laughs> tried to cry. Because I thought, I, in my mind, I, I associated love with crying. Oh, I love you. And I tried to do that. I went, I love you. I love you. I love you. I tried to do all of those things because I thought this love thing, it was like, and then as I began to read the word of God, love is not an emotion, it's an action. Because somebody can tell you, I love you, I love you, I love you, but how you really know they love you is by their actions. Some people can, the Bible says that God says people draw too close to me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. And so love, real love is it's found in the action. When I love my wife, it's not just I, I, you have that emotional attachment. Of course you do, but it's every time I go out, I, I go shopping, I think about her and my daughter. If I go, I'll go to the ladies' section, I'll go start looking through clothes. Some people go, oh, I saw the pastor in the women's section. <laughs> and I'll even, if I know they come from the church, I'll tease them. I'll say, I, I, I'll say to the, the, the lady that's helping, I'll say, I, I don't know, do you have this one in my size? Because what happens is when you realize you have value, your value is seen in the cross. Your value is seen in what Jesus sacrificed, what God sacrificed for you. And when you realize your worth and your value, then, only then, will you ever step out in the authority that God has given you. The authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. The authority to bind spirits and cast out devils. The authority. Because if you have no value, you don't feel any value, you won't walk in authority. And so you need to know your value. And so the Bible shows you, and I want to show this to you tonight, your value. This is where your value. Turn to me to Ephesians 1. I love Ephesians because Ephesians was written in the past tense. Ephesians was written about what God has already done. We have this idea that God is going to do something. No, God has done everything he needs to do is already done. Every need you have, already, have right now, you will ever have, has already been met. It's already done. You have been blessed. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places through Christ Jesus. So in other words, your blessings are waiting there for you. Every single blessing has already been provided. It's like, you, like when I go shopping, I, I know what Sylvia likes and I know what Abigail likes for, in the cupboard for food. And so I'll go and buy all of that and it's in the cupboard. So if, she wants, if Abigail wants a biscuit, she say, all she does is shouts, Dad, can I have a biscuit? I say, sure, it's in the cupboard. I don't have to go out and manufacture a biscuit. It's already there. 
All she's asking me is, can she have it? So every need that you have, God has already provided. It's already been done. It's already been provided by the power of the Holy Spirit in the heavenly realms, but you have to get it from there here to here by faith that it's already done. And so Ephesians speaks about things that are already done. It's already been done. That's why when, on the TV shows, on uh, these different TV shows, these preachers come up and they say, if you give a thousand rand, God is, God is just, people tell you, God is just about to do something. God is not about to do anything. Understand something, God is God. God is not going to stand up for a thousand dollars. God is not going to do mighty miracles. He's done everything he needs to do. He's given you power and authority. He's, given you, he's shown you your worth. He's shown you your value. And he's given you power and authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and to take what Jesus has won. To insist that the devil cannot keep my life bound because I've been transferred from a kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of love. A kingdom of love is to be ruled by love. Love means that God doesn't mean that you can get away with things. Understand something, when somebody loves you, it, that's human love where, oh, I love you, you can do that. God doesn't do that. True love is when so, you, somebody does something, it's not allowing that person to get away with something. It's teaching them that that's going to hurt you. And so true love, as God has given up in his word, he says, these things don't do. He's telling you not to do them, not for his sake, it's for your sake. Everything in the Word of God is for your sake. It's not for God's sake. And I'm not saying for God's sake, a swear word. One day I made a mistake when I came to Cape Town and I said something in Afrikaans that is a bad word. And uh, so I don't speak Afrikaans anymore because <laughs> cause I'll say, I said some swear words. and I wish I could say some swear words to the devil sometimes. You just want to say... If, if, when I first got saved, I did. And my father came to me and said, Dwellen, you can't talk to that. I said, but the devil came up with those words. He understands what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm not talking to Jesus like that. I'm talking to him. <laughs> and one of the greatest things that I found, I was always looking for peace and joy. And Romans says, peace and joy come in believing. Peace and joy don't just come. The Bible says in Romans, it says, peace and joy come in believing. Let me just find that scripture. It says here in Romans 15 verse 13. May the God of your hope so fill you with all joy and peace in believing... So peace and joy come in believing. What do you believe? What God has said is the truth, that you have been blessed. If you know you have been blessed, then there's peace, there's joy. All you have to do is move it from one place to the other. You've already been blessed. So all you do is thank him for what he's done. When, when Abigail goes to the cupboard to take the biscuit out that I bought a long time ago, it's already been provided for her, all she does is say thank you. And as a parent, that's all you want. And so peace and joy don't just come. So people are praying, oh, Lord, give me peace, give me peace. The Bible says peace and joy come in believing. What do you believe? That your, your needs have already been met. You believe what Jesus has said is the truth. You believe that. And so joy and peace come because if you don't believe, worry comes. The other side of peace and joy is worry. And so, but the most important thing as a young person or any person, I had to realize something that I have value because when I got saved, people said, you have no value. You're 40 years old. The children of Israel were in the desert for 40 years, and then God killed them all. That was my introduction. I was so excited when I first got to church. I used to cheers Jesus in the communion time. The cup came, cheers Jesus. No, don't do that. This is a holy time. I thought it was a time of celebration. That the blood was a sign of the covenant that he made with me. The blood was a sign that he's washed my sins away. That should be a happy time. It shouldn't be a sad time. I'm not crying because Judas betrayed him. On the night he was betrayed. And we all go, oh no. 
And it's like every, and so when I got to church, it was like everything was sad. Everything was like, you know, you want to get to the club. You know, eh, eh. Have a bit of the spirits. Because you know that the, the pub and the clubs are, are just a counterfeit of what God can do. You know, when you go to the pub, there's the, the barman, he's the pastor, and you drink spirits, <laughs> and you tell him your problems, just like you do with a pastor, and you get drunk and they send you home. <laughs> but one of the most wonderful things is I had to realize that God loves me. Not me, the, 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 the me that's in a circle of people, but me as an individual. Jesus came and died for me. He came and shed his blood for me. He loves me. Not me as a group, me. Because when you come and face the devil, it's you alone. There's going to be nobody else because the devil doesn't come to your house when the pastor's there. The devil always attacks when you are alone. Any type of attack, if you don't know, have value in yourself, if you don't have self-worth, you will never step out in your authority because you don't think you deserve that authority. And the only way you know you deserve authority is that Jesus made you deserving. It's a free gift that was given to you by grace that you take by faith. Everything God gives is by grace. It's already been done by grace. But you take it with faith. Faith means that what God has given you by grace, you trust that he's given it to you and you take it. You receive it. This morning when we were praying for the sick, so many people, they push the power of God straight back my, into my arm. Because they are trying to, they think they need to deserve it. A lot of times people don't get healed because deep on the inside of them, they think to themselves, maybe I'm sick because I've done something wrong. And God is punishing me. It's not said by their mouths. It's not, it's not even expressed openly. But deep on the inside of them, I might be in this thing because you know that you've sinned somewhere along the line. Maybe I've got this disease in my life is because I've done something and God is punishing me. And if you have that on the inside of you, you'll never get healed. A lot of people don't know how to receive. Especially Christians that have been Christians, people that have been Christians for a long time. They don't know how to receive. Because they are always giving. They are always praying for the sick. They always hand up, but it's very hard for them to receive for themselves. That's why so many pastors are sick today. So many pastors die from diseases because they don't know how to take, to get healed themselves. They, have, they are so used to administering healing under the anointing that they don't know that they have value and that Jesus can heal them because the power, the power is not going to come from out here. There's no power out here. The power is inside here. The same power that in Ephesians 1.17 says, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The same power God used to raise Jesus from the dead dwells in you. There's resurrection power on the inside of you. You can't feel it, but it's there. And so, as I had to, I, because I was always told you have no worth because of the stuff you did, your worth is, you don't have much worth now. Thank God you're saved, but there's no other value here. Yes, you're going to get to heaven one day. Just don't make a mess up while you're here. Just don't mess around with us. Just don't come and bring some newfangled thing into the church. Don't, don't be so excited. You know, you need to mature. Dress, you're dressing wrong. Dress old. You need to dress like we dress. You need to have a tie. I don't have a tie. I have this. Why, it's mine. I don't care what you think. I style myself. See, my, i got a pocket square. Yeah. Because if you look like everybody else, you just, you just fit into the crowd. You, spoke, you are designed to stand out from the crowd. You're not designed to be one of the crowd. It's all, oh, 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 oh. hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. There's no joy. And what I found that there's no joy. No one's excited about anything. It's like, oh, I got saved. Oh, and they always talk about their past life. Oh, you know, 
I used to get up to up some things, let me tell you. Oh, and you can hear in their voice, they actually desire to be back there. But they, but they actually don't want to go back there because they won't get into heaven. So if I go back to what I actually like, I'm not going to get into heaven, so I'm weighing up, should I go back or should I stay here? But it's not about heaven, it's about fellowshipping with Jesus. It's about knowing Jesus, because you can't get into heaven without knowing him. The Bible says there are many who are going to come on that day and say, we cast out devils in your name, we prophesied in your name, we did mighty works in your name, and he's going to be say, be gone from me, I never knew you. I don't know you. All those works that you did, in my eyes, Jesus said, is works of iniquity. Because he wants to know you here. You can't get to know him there. And the only way you get to know God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is through this word. And that's why, the devil, that's why you pick up the word, you go to sleep. You pick up this word. You don't need a sleeping tablet. Just pick up the word. The devil will rock you to sleep. Straight Just <laughs> Ephesians 1. <laughs> Now, you're laughing because you know it's true. <laughs> you can watch, you can play, you, you can play PlayStation 4 all night. <laughs> Two o'clock. I don't have, I don't care, I don't, I don't have to get to work at eight. <laughs> watch TV. Two o'clock. <laughs> you need to go to sleep. No, no, I just want to watch the end. I just want to watch the end. Why do I pick up the word? Just, just pick it up. John 3, you don't even get to the 16. John 3, well. Because the devil knows if you get this word inside of you, you become powerful. You become something that is dangerous to his kingdom. Because this word shows you your value. It shows you your worth. And so Ephesians, in Ephesians 1, it says, May the blessing be to God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing given by the Holy Spirit, even as in his love he chose us. Why did he choose me? My question always, why did you choose me? Out of all the people in this world, I'm the one that feels the way I do. I'm, I'm, I'm the one that thinks the way I do. Why do you choose me? Why did you choose me? And so, when, he, when I began to read this word, it says, even in his love, he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own in Christ before the foundation of the earth. He picked you. Many of us know what it's, what it's like not to be picked. When you go and play soccer in the field, and they know you don't know how to play soccer. I, I used to play rugby, and all I had, well, I, I wanted to play soccer, and my father, and the old, when I was young, which is in the dinosaur days, they used to have different boots for rugby and for soccer. Rugby boots had, used to have like a big knob on the front, and they used to be up to here. And I used to play full back. I never kicked the ball once, but people many times. <laughs> the striker would come running down. I just forget the ball. I just boot him. Boom. He only ran down my side once. The rest of the game, he played the other side. <laughs> and so I was never chosen because I had rugby boots on playing soccer. But you know what it's like to not feel chosen. You're not being chosen, you, you get together with a group of people, and they, they pick in sides, and they say, okay, we'll pick you, and if you get picked first, then you know you're sort of like on the top, and then you get picked second, you're still up there, you know, and you and the first one, the first one, they stand and look at each other, mm. <laughs> and you stand in there with your rugby boots on playing soccer. And they leave you till last, and they have to pick you. And then they discuss it openly. Do you want him? <laughs> what you want? Uh, uh, uh. I don't want him. <laughs> last time we chose him. Look at my legs. <laughs> last time we chose him, he booted me. But when I
God chose me before he laid out the foundations of the earth. He picked me out for himself. He didn't pick me for any other reason. He picked me out for himself. He said, I want him. Before time, I want him for this time. Before time, I want him for this time. And that's what he did for you. You see, all of our lives are different. We all brought up different ways. And our lifestyles is not all the same. We've been picked for different re- we, 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 we come up in different ways. And sometimes we feel that we have never ever have worth because we've done nothing. We haven't accomplished anything. And people are always talking about how wonderful their kids are. And they put them on Facebook and my child just won Victor Ladellorum. <laughs> I know it's Victor Ladorum or whatever it is. Victor Le something. And how wonderful my child is, and all the children are standing there and they got the <laughs> And your child just can barely eat, you know, just doesn't even know where the knife and fork is, you know, it's just like uh, uh, uh. And yeah, as the kids same age, they're just all bright and they're talking Bible English, you know. Hallelujah, God saith. And they're only like four years old, you know, they're talking all this language, and your child can barely grunt. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and they're saying how wonderful your child is. And they're giving, and then they're, they're presenting their children with, and I'm not knocking you if, you, if I'm talking about you. Don't understand, I'm not knocking you. But when you do, when you do that and you look at your child, it's, it's like, this child can barely lift a fork. <laughs> and you know, like some children, you have to say, don't do it, don't do it, don't. Some children, you say, just don't do it, and they don't do it. And so what happens is that I was brought up like that because I'd never accomplished anything in life. I never, I never painted anything. I never, I never accomplished anything in life. And so if, you put your, if your value is in what you've done, when you're not doing that anymore, you don't have value. If your value is in your sport or what you did in the past, if your value lies there, then when you don't do that anymore, in your mind, you don't have value. So your value lies in this one fact. As a born-again child of God, your, your value lies in this, that God chose you before he created the earth. He didn't create the earth first. He created you first and the earth for you. It's a simple truth, but it's powerful. He chose you and then created the earth for you. He didn't create the earth and then put you in the earth. He created you and then he made a place for you. You were chosen before he laid the foundations of the earth. He laid the foundations of the earth and he laid all those things in place for you. He actually picked you out for himself. Now when you think about that, let your mind just stroll around those ideas because God, the self-existent God who created all things, chose you. So who cares who doesn't choose you? Who cares if you're not chosen by anybody else? God chose me. So when you walk in that confidence, God chose me. I don't care whether you choose me or God chose me. I don't need you to to give me any validation. God chose me. I don't need you to tell me I'm good or I'm bad. God chose me. I mean, you don't do that like an idiot and, and, you know, just walk around. God chose me. God chose me. No, you don't do that. You just say, I don't need you. I, God chose me. No, I'm not talking about doing it. I'm just demonstrating that inside of you, when you're walking through something, you're not afraid because God is with you. God chose you and he chooses to be with you. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you, no matter how you feel. Feelings are a dangerous thing because sometimes you feel that you rejected. And sometimes you, it's not just a feeling, you are rejected. Oh, it's just in your mind. No, it's not. Sometimes you are rejected by people. It's not that it's just a feeling. I, I remember when I first got saved, and everybody was chosen before me. Because you got saved late, so you get to the back of the line.
And my, my father used to do is because I was his son, he would never ever give me special permission. I always had to start at the bottom, which you should do. You shouldn't get special place in the ministry because you're the pastor's son. And all the pastors, other pastors that were there, they used to laugh at me when I first got saved. Because I used to be cleaning the trucks and going to pick up food and looking after the alcoholics and drug addicts and getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and looking after them. And I loved doing it. But they said, one day you'll be like me. And inside of me, I said, no, I never want to be like you. Because they walked around with this haughty, torty thing, you know. I'm a pastor. You a truck cleaner. I had to realize my own, that's why I said nobody's coming, because if you don't realize, understand something very clearly in your mind, that it's you and God and you don't need anybody else. You don't need validation from anybody else. God chose you. I love that when in, in, the, in the actual Greek it says, God personally picked you out for himself. So you've been picked by God. I want you. So how you remind yourself of that, when you get home tonight, lift up your shirt and see your belly button. God said, I chose you. I chose you. I chose you. So every time you look at your belly button, that's indentation, God's finger said, I chose you. So when you're feeling left out, just look down at your belly button. God chose me. I don't think you heard that in church before. <laughs> this is called the belly button gospel. <laughs> so God personally picked you out, even in his love, in his love, his love he chose you, his love he chose you, his love. And Paul said, goes on later and he says, we believe the love. We believe the love, that action of love. We believe the action of love. In, in relationships, people tell you they love you all the time. Girls, you know this. And guys. Somebody can say, I love you, but they can have six girlfriends. They don't love you, they lust you. There's a big thing. They just want one. They don't want one, they want more than one. That's not love. I, I, we counsel people all the time. As one girl came to get counseling, and she was going out to the drug dealer. And I used to be in drugs, so I know what drug dealers do. So she said, oh, I love this guy, and what do you think? I said, tell him to come and see me. So I said, because he doesn't just have one girlfriend. He's got more than one girlfriend. If he's a good drug dealer, he has more than one girlfriend. Because you've got to, have an, you've got to impress the people you're selling drugs to. You've got to be a player. Otherwise, why do I go and get drugs from you? I want to hear stories about all your girlfriends. Because when I come and buy drugs, I want a story as well. If I'm paying 400 bucks an ounce for Coke, I want a story that goes with it. I want hot chicks around. I'm talking from a worldly perspective now, not as a Christian. So I said to him, he's, if, he, if, if he's, get away from me, he's got more than one girlfriend. I said, Has he, have you got his code in your phone? He's the code for his phone. Husbands and wives, if you haven't got your husband's code, there's something wrong. Oh, I got quiet in the house today. Because <laughs> you should be able to go to his phone and his... Because if you ever see your husband and he's in the room and he's on his... Uh, on his... on the laptop and you walk and he goes, oh, watch it. <laughs> Because this story about, you don't need to know what's going on here. You know, like, that, like, that, like what's it, Star Wars, that Yoda thing? Move on, you don't need to know what's going on here. Men try and hypnotize their wives, don't look here. My wife's got everything. She's got my bank account, my pins, my phone. She can look at my phone anytime she wants to. Because if you don't have the pin, you don't have his heart. <coughs> Yes. So, so true, you, you could say, oh, I love you, baby, I love you, but you can't have my pin. I love you, baby. 
So in his love for you, God had to satisfy that love within himself by choosing you. God had this love inside of him that he needed to satisfy. And so in his love, he chose you. And then in verse 5, he foreordained, he destined, planned in love for us. We were talking about love today, tonight. Oh, how he loves me. He planned in love. In verse 5, he foreordained, destined us, planned in love for us to be adopted. To be, re- to be adopted is not what we think of being adopted today, where you go to a, a place and you go and adopt a child, or you adopt a dog. You know, adopt a dog. <laughs> you go and get a dog and... and That's not what adoption means in the Bible. The Bible means that in his love, he's revealed us as his child. There's a revelation to everybody that we are his child. That's what adopted means. It doesn't mean that he took us and he adopted us from somewhere where nobody else wanted us. In the Bible, adoption means to be revealed as. In his love, he revealed us as his child. To the heavenlies, to heaven, to the angels, to principalities and powers. This is my child. That's why you get so attacked. Because God is saying, this is my child. You know that people don't like tattoos, but God's, your name is tattooed in his hand. The Bible says that your name is tattooed. Tattooed. Indelible ink. So he holds it. He says, have you seen my child? I chose this one before time began. Everybody he sees in heaven, he says, Let's look at the picture. Indelible ink. In other words, it can't be written out. Do you know that Jesus is tattooed? Ooh. Bible says when he comes, Jesus Christ, Son of God, tattooed on his leg. I don't like tattoos. What's written here? Tattooed. Jesus. Where's Jesus on you? All those who don't like tattoos I'm talking to. (laughs) Tattooed. Jesus. Tattooed. Cross of thorns. Tattooed. Tougher than hell. Tattooed. Secrets of God. Secrets of God. Tattooed. A warrior doing the victory dance before the battle. People know if I'm dead, they just have to look at my body. Jesus, we know this way, take him. I'm just playing with you guys. Don't get all excited and say, I don't want my children, I don't want to have my daughter tattooed either. But these helped me. When I first got saved, I was tattooed because I was so alone. Nobody wanted, no Christian wanted anything to do with me. I'm including people in my family because I was so bad. I hurt my family so badly. I hurt my sisters. I hurt my mother and father. I stole from them. They put their purse down. I could steal out of a purse so quick that the money would be out and closed in seconds. I learned to steal what's at the back of the drawer, not in the front of the drawer. Because they only notice it later, then you can always blame it on the maid. Some of you guys are, don't tell me any more secrets. I, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I, I found out how my father's safe works. You just take, you know, the woman's face powder, the brush, and you put it on the keys, and you can see which keys have been used. And then you just try those different combinations until it, boop. I was terrible. So when I got saved, nobody believed I was saved. They, it's impossible. My family got together and said, it's time. He's 40 years old. We've got to disown him. We got, you've got to get out of our family. This, this guy's stealing everything that moves. 
my, my brother-in-law used to sleep with his mouth closed because I was scared I'd steal the gold out of his teeth. <laughs> Don't tell him I told you. <laughs> and I'm not proud of it at all. I really am not. So when I got saved, people said, that's impossible. Not even Jesus can save this guy. It's impossible. So when I've called my mother, my, my mother and father had left the country because I was on an investigation for murder. My mother and father left the country. They couldn't take it anymore. But when Jesus found me at the bottom of the bottom's bottom, People had got tired of the same old story. But when Jesus found me, and I realized he first loved me, we didn't love him, the Bible says, he first loved us. Even when we were lost in sin, he loved us and gave his life for us. And so when I got saved, I, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to soften anything about myself. I was guilty as guilty can be. I did the wrong thing. And I would always promise I wouldn't do that again. I would always promise this and that. And I made excuses for why I did it. My father wasn't around for me. My mother wasn't there for me. This person wasn't there. This person did this and this person did that. No, you've got to live your life. And you can't live it by living by excuses of what other people do. This person did that, so therefore I'm doing this. I used to fall into that. Somebody used to hurt me. I used to go and get drunk and hurt myself. And I get into that whole thing. And so when I got saved, everybody said, it's impossible that he's saved. And so what I had to do, and I thank God for this every single day, that nobody helped me. I thank God for it. Because what it did was get me to go into my room, lock myself in that room, and get close with God. I just, I took the word, I put it on a cassette tape, and I took the word, and I listened to it, and I listened to it, and I listened to it, and I know about falling asleep because I went to sleep, but I said, I don't care, I'm going to get this word inside of me, whether I have to force it in, and I'd put the tape on, and I'd read it. If my eyes closed, I would listen to the tape. When the tape clicked off, I'd turn the tape over. When I woke up, I'd read the word again, because the Bible says, faith comes by hearing, not by reading the word. You need to read the word aloud to yourself. If you fall asleep, put the word on. Every single night of my life, I go to sleep with the word playing. You can go into YouTube and you can listen to the Psalms. It's free. Don't go to sleep with the news playing. Fox. Christians love Fox. Fox TV. I don't know about in South Africa, but in America, everybody's watching Fox. The president is so wonderful. Trump. Trump. All the Christians in the office. He is not a Christian. He's not. He's just bluffing everybody. He knows he's going to get votes. <laughs> oh, I'm stepping on some toes tonight. That's a good politician. See, I was a good, when I, I promise you, I, I stole a lot of money. I know a good con man when I see one. You just play the political, you play the patriotic flag. You love the Christians, put prayer back in schools. Christians will love you and vote for you. And you're making money all the time. He's a money maker. That's his job. But when I had to, I had to realize something that, I, I joke about all those things, and I don't really care. I, I've never watched the news. I never watch the news. People said, you know there's an earthquake? I said, no, I didn't know that. Cape Town had an earthquake. Really? Shame. <laughs> Move to Durban. <laughs> nothing happens there. <laughs> I mean nothing. No, I'm joking. It's the best town. But what it forced me to do is go into my room, and that's why I always say, take a three-month where you don't do anything except to read the word. Put the Bible in the toilet for men, because men like to read on the toilet. Put a the Bible there. If you like to lie in the bath, put a Bible there. And take a three month where you don't watch TV, you just read the Bible. I can hear some people on the inside of them going, oh, what? 
my show. And it forced me, because I, I, used to, I got so excited because God started dealing with me personally. I began to see God from a totally different perspective, not through other people's words, but through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth began to reveal who God is to me on a personal level. And so I used to go out to Christians and say, have you seen this in the Word? I was so excited about the Word. And because of, of my background, and I was in drugs and all that type of thing, people used to go, all the Christians, I said, have you seen this in the Word? What Ephesians says, it says that God personally picked me out. Have you seen this? And they'd all look at me, like some of you are looking at me, and go, shame, shame. See, a lot of people know the Word, but they don't live the word. They know what the Bible says, but they don't live in their truth. And so I had, to, it's the greatest thing is, is when pastor doesn't come visit you, don't worry. People get so upset when the pastor doesn't come and visit. The pa- well, they're not having any program at the church that I need to lead, lead the word, read the word. And so I'm not reading the word because they don't have a program at the church. No, just get in the word yourself because one day you're going to stand before God yourself, by yourself. And you have to give an account of what you did in your body. Not with your body, in your body. Because the real you is your spirit and your soul that lives inside of you that's going to live forever. This body just carries you around this earth. And so when you get together with the Lord, now from all of that that happened to me and people said and didn't want me, which was bad at the time, I felt rejected and everything else. But what it did was, the the ultimate thing was today, I have such a wonderful relationship with God. I never ever go and say, I need something. I say, Father, I've just come to say, I've just come to say I love you. I've just come to say thank you for the great sacrifice you made by sending your son. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. Thank you for allowing yourself to become my sin. So that I can have your righteousness. I just want to thank you. And if the, I just want to thank you. If there's anything in me that is offensive to you. If there's anything that I've offended you by. I'm sorry. And that, develop, that relationship that I developed in that room. Hours and hours and hours. Spending time with him. Has given me such a peace and a joy because I believe what he says. I believe he chose me and that gives me peace. I believe he personally picked me out and that gives me joy because the Bible says peace and joy come in believing what God has said. So I want you just to take Ephesians, go right through Ephesians. I've just started to tell you your value. People have told you that you're no good. You're not the right color. You're not, some, some people said, you're not white. You're not black. You're stuck in between. People have said terrible things. I, I spoke about this morning. The, 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 there's curses that have come upon uh, 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 cultures, and na- especially amongst whites, because of the terrible uh, 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 attitudes that have. They've come. Apartheid is simply pride. And that's one sin that God hates more than any other is pride. That you think you're better than anybody else. And so you won't fellowship with anybody else. Apartheid can be not just the color of your skin, but because you don't have the same job as me. You, you, you might not be an a, a executive. And, and so I can't, I can't mess around with you. I, I can't mix with you. Because you, you, you're not on the same level as me. That's apartheid. That's pride. I have nothing in common with you. I, I, you know, you don't get invited to the, to the, to the inner sanctum. Because I, I, I see your position in the church as only this. I, I can't fellowship with you as a new creation in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. Baby Christians can teach older Christians a lot. There's simple love for Jesus Christ. That love that's still fresh on the inside of them. I never ever want to lose that. I never want Christianity to become a form. Because when I remember that God chose me before the foundation of this earth, He put everything in this earth for me. 
Right at this moment, there are diamonds being created out of coal just for me and for you. And we have to understand something that God is holy. That God is magnificent. God is not here for us. We are here for him. He is the one that we respect. He is the one we bow to. He is the one that we reverence. We stand in awe of him. We don't fear him like in terror. We stand in awe when you see. The only time you ever stand in awe of God is when you see how great he is. I was watching the Blue Planet 2 that's just come out. And when you look at the magnificence of what the cameras can do now, they can go right down to the deepest part of the sea. And you see life right miles down in the ocean. There's life where they thought there was nothing. They just thought it was a desert. Now with these special cameras, they find this life. Now understand something that God had that life there before those cameras were created. So God created those creatures for us to see today because the cameras are able to pick them up. Those creatures there are created for us. No one else in history has ever seen them. We can see them now because God gave men the ability to be able to go to those depths and create the cameras that can find that life so that we can see it, so we can see, recognize His greatness and we can praise Him. I was standing in Mauritius and these little fish came around my, my legs. And I felt so rejected. So rejected. And I looked down and these little fish were just swimming around. And I heard this gentle voice. He said, Llewellyn, I created those fish just for you to see in this moment. Just for you. They were swimming around my legs and it was like, I want to be with you. God's creation wanted to be with me. What God created wants to be with me. And if God's creation wants to be with me, then imagine the God that created this wants to be with me. And inside of me, I said, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care. I want to know Him more and more and more. I want to know Him tomorrow better than I know Him today. I love spending time with Him because He loves me when no one else did. When I was lost, He loved me. When I was found, He loved me. He didn't care about my position, whether I was saved or lost. He loved me. God is not interested in your performance. He loves you because He created you as a masterpiece, the one and only masterpiece that will ever exist from the beginning of time until the end of time. Sitting in those chairs in front of me are masterpieces of God, one and only. There is no one else like you that was ever going to be created from the beginning of time until the end of time that will think like you, talk like you, react like you. There's no one else. God created your face. That's why you should love your face. If somebody doesn't love you, they don't, don't worry about them. Because masterpieces are one. There's only one masterpiece. If you are a masterpiece, you are one. I love the other word for masterpiece. It's poetry. You are God's heavenly piece of poetry that he wrote before time. How can you not feel loved? That the creator of all things chose you and me. To fellowship with us. I think it's such a great privilege to be a Christian. I don't ever just stand up and say, do you want to give your life to the Lord? If you don't give your life to the Lord, you're going to hell. No. Do you want to know him? Do you want to know him? Not do you want to go to heaven or do you want to stay out of hell? Because those are the benefits of knowing him. If you don't know him, you can get saved. You can give your life to Jesus. You can go through the emotions. But you, if you don't know him, it's knowing him. It's every day falling and getting up again. It's not being perfect. It's every day seeing in the word of God what he requires from us. And you discipline yourself into becoming more and more like Jesus. 
becoming more and more like Him by the help of the Holy Spirit to become something there's many falls before you accomplish anything there's more failures before there are successes every great success there was always millions of failures before there was a success and you're going to fall you're not going to be perfect in your walk but every day Paul said leaving what's behind and stretching forth for what lies ahead I'm moving on I don't care how many times I go down if I go down once I'm standing up twice I don't care how many times you go down stand up again get rid of your sad sob story nobody's interested I promise you I've had the best sad stories in my life nobody's interested you got to take care of yourself because if you don't love yourself you'll never love anybody else it's impossible to love others if you don't realize you have value because you'll always say to yourself what can I really give them that's why guys say oh, I met my wife and she's right out of my league my wife's not out of my league she's in my league everybody's whether you're president or not I'm, the, I'm Llewellyn I'm not impressed by titles I'm not impressed by anybody I've been with the president he came into this is a true story I came in and they said to him I was with Pastor Theo Vilmerantz and he's always impeccably dressed and so he said is my tuck is my tie straight I said let me check and I moved it slightly because the president was coming and I'm standing with my back to the door and I'm looking at and I see Theo's eyes go up and I said he said I'm getting I need my tie to be straight because the president's coming so I said, you need to ask the president if he wants to, why are you worried about him, you getting a picture with him? He needs to ask him if he wants a picture with me. And I felt a hand on my shoulder. It was President Mbeki. And I turned around and he put his arm around me. And he said, take a picture of us. Take a picture of us. See, when somebody thinks they're better than you, they always got that look. Just you can get into the selfie, but I'm the self. It's not a it's not a, a selfie is not a joint thing. And titles don't impress me because I was chosen by God. Don't let people's position things impress you. You were chosen by God. You were chosen. Chosen. And God chose you to fellowship with Him, but it's up to you to choose to want to fellowship with Him. He doesn't want to force you. He doesn't say, if you don't want to fellowship with me, I'm sending you to hell. We send ourselves to hell by rejecting the love of Jesus Christ. And so you have to make up your mind whether you want to give your life to Jesus Christ or not, because you give your life to Him. It's no longer your life. You have been bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. You have to decide whether you're going to give your life to Him. And you're going to say, yes, Lord, I don't matter what, I'm going to give my life to you. I messed up my life so badly. It is an absolute honor and a privilege to be a Christian, to be able to fellowship with God on a personal level. You don't have to go to Bible school for that. You don't have to do anything. He wants to fellowship with you. But there's a price to be paid. You've got to leave yourself. You've got to leave all of those things and say, Jesus, I want you and I want you alone. I'm determined to fellowship with you. See, so many people can give their lives. I can preach a great message on hell and get people to become afraid and put up their hand and come and give their life to Jesus Christ, but their Christianity doesn't last. Out of all the people that got saved in my time, three of us are still saved not one of us ever had a pastoral visit I'm still waiting for a pastor to visit me but I was determined to know him that this God that loves me with all my faults all my failings all my stinkiness he loves me he chose me he said I want him I personally want him to talk to me You could ask yourself the question, do you want that in your life? Because 
people have lied so much in church that they lie from the pulpit. They say you're going to get into heaven. You can't get into heaven just because you raised your hand in church. You go to heaven because you've given your life to Jesus freely. From your heart, you give it to him. And it becomes you and him. And you and him are a warring army that can never be defeated. He'll give you power and authority. He's tread upon serpents and scorpions. But the most important thing he gives you is peace and joy in believing in him. It's a peace and a joy. The Bible says that passes all human understanding. It's a peace that settles inside of you. That it doesn't matter what you're going through, this peace. It doesn't matter what you're going through, there is joy. I'm not talking about happiness. Happiness comes when you get a lot of money and you're happy for a while or you win the lotto, that's happy. I'm talking about joy where there's an excitement on the inside of you about nothing. You wake up in the morning and you have this joy on the inside of you. It's His joy that He gives you in believing in Him. It's something that's supernatural that comes into your life. It's nobody can, you can't try to explain, it's difficult to explain, but you can wake up in the morning with no money and be joyful. You can go through a death of a loved one and be joyful. You can have tears running down your face, but still have this joy on the inside of you. And it comes in believing that you're going to see your loved one again. That they've just gone ahead to this place. I'm going to see my loved one again. I'm going to see my father again. I'm going to see them again. We do not weep like the world weeps. We do not grieve like the world grieves. We do grieve, but we don't grieve like the world who have no hope. We have a hope. We have a confident expectation that what God said is the truth, that there's a place where our loved ones are waiting for us. And we will see them again. When you go to a Christian funeral and you go to an unsafe funeral, there is such a loss. And I never see that loved one. I never see that child again. If you've lost a child, you're going to see that child again. A child is waiting for you. The same age it was, she was, he was, is there. To live this life is to be real. It's not a super spiritual thing, it's a day by day thing. I'm just getting to know Jesus better every single day. It has to be a determination in your heart that I want to do it. I don't have to do it. I want to do it. That's the difference between a Christian lifestyle and legalism. Is I want Jesus. I want him. I want him to direct my life. Because I've made it such a mess of my life. I've messed it up. I want him. And I want you to go home. And take some personal time with God. Just say, Lord, Holy Spirit, show me. If he's, I'm talking about Christians, every single person here today. Am I just, have I, have I got this attitude? Have I got the wrong attitude about you? I'm just trying to use you to get the things I want in love. But I've never shown you proper respect. I've never looked from your point of view, from your side of the sacrifice you made for me. And when I think about your sacrifice that you made, when your son died on that cross and you had to turn your head so you never have to turn your, you never have to turn your head from me. That's love. Love is seen in the action of the crucifixion. It's love. But it's personal. It's not a matter of standing here and going at the back there and getting, getting the form and the thing. It's going home and being honest with God, open and honest with Him and say, Lord, I've messed up. But I'm not running away from my mess up. I'm coming to you. I've come to tell you, the Bible says in 1 John, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there is a throne, a throne of grace that we can come to. And when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is not for the unsaved. That is for Christians. Paul said, my beloved ones, my little ones, he's talking to Christians. He's not talking to the unsaved there. There's a place that we can come when we've messed up. 
It's a place of love. It's a place of grace. That we can come to and just fall and say, I messed up. I know I have. But I know that you love me and that you chose me and that you're going to keep loving me and you're going to keep choosing me and you're going to keep helping me walk this walk and getting to become like Jesus more and more and more in my life. And that's what I want. Because if you don't want him, tell him you don't want him. If you don't want him in your life, go and be the best sinner you can be. Go to hell first class. And when you get to hell, tell the devil, I've come to take over. But if you're going to be a Christian, be a first class Christian, not a religious Christian. Not somebody that just comes to church, but somebody that's sold out to Jesus. And when somebody has a problem, you say, I've got the answer for you. His name is Jesus. When people are lonely, I've got the answer for you. His name is Jesus. When people are sick, I've got the answer for you. His name is Jesus. When demons attack, I've got the answer for every attack. It's Jesus. And what he has done for me. We've got to be real with them. The superficial Christianity has got to end in our lives. It's either got to be real or leave it alone. Be hot or cold. Never be lukewarm. Be hot or cold. We have to make a choice. Be hot or cold. And it's knowing Him. It's getting to know Him personally on a personal level just every single day. It's getting to this Word and say, Lord, Holy Spirit, just show me. Teach me. That's what I did. I just said, teach me. I'm not the greatest brain in the world. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Sometimes the wheel's still spinning, but the hamster's dead. I didn't understand this. And I hear these great preachers, they got these big theoretical things, and I just give the word and I say, this is God's word, God speaking to me, Holy Spirit, you're the spirit of truth. You teach me. And I open this word, and all of a sudden, this revelation begins to come. And the most important revelation that came into my heart was, Llewellyn, you're chosen by me. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. In my love, I chose you. And I want to be with you. I'll wait for you to wake up. Because I never slumber and sleep, but you do. But when you're asleep, I look at you. And I want you to wake up so I can speak with you. There's got to be that love relationship. And it only comes through you in this word. Say, well, but you're a pastor. That's, that's, that's your whole thing. I, I'm a mechanic, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. You are not your profession. You are somebody that was chosen by God. And it's up to you to be cho- cho- You're chosen, but you have to choose to be chosen. You have to choose to respond. And I want you to do that tonight when you get home. Before you put on the tea and the coffee, before you eat your samosa or your cook sister or eat your briyadi or your curry or your pudu say Lord I want to just thank you for choosing me reveal yourself to me through this word and I'm telling you something in six months your life will change Six months your life will change. But you got to be prepared to put the effort in to get to know him. Know somebody takes effort. In any relationships, getting to know somebody takes an effort from both sides. I want to encourage you today. He's waiting for you. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what you've said. He's waiting for you because he chose you. Heavenly Father, thank you for choosing us. Thank you that our peace and our joy come in believing and all that you have said and all that you have promised. I just want to thank you. I just want to honor you tonight with all that I have. Thank you for loving us and choosing us. I pray that Holy Spirit reveal yourself to each and every one today. Flood the eyes of our heart with your light, the light of your revelation so that we can know and understand what you called us to. Lord, flood the eyes of our heart with your light. 
so we can know our inheritance among the saints. And Lord, I pray that you'll flood the eyes of our heart with your light and revelations, that we will know the power that's in us and for us because we believe in you. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Lord, that we would know and understand and walk in it. Walk in these spiritual blessings that you've already provided for us. I give you all the praise, the glory and honor. Only you are worthy of it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We hope you've been blessed by this anointed message. For information on other Good Hope Christian Center CDs and products, call 021-703-9400 or write to Good Hope Christian Center, corner of Panton and Plantation Roads, Ottery, 7800 or visit our website at www.ghcc.tv.